Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we'd like to read the Cove Heritage Vintage Era. We'd like to welcome you here to the Heritage Centre this evening. We'd like to thank Jack and his staff for their help and for their welcoming us here every week. And um, we are here tonight to speak to you about the Lusitania and Jerome B. Murphy, the unknown, the un forgotten hero who was um, a great help to the, the saving of lives on the Lusitania in 1915. And to introduce the, the, the crew here tonight, there is Stella and Kevin, Hi. Emily, Malcolm, Jan and Eileen and myself, Karen. Myself, Eileen and Stella will speak to you after about three of the passengers and their escapades. The three of them were in, they were second, uh, second passengers and they all were in the one cabin and the outcome of what their lives had become. So I'll hand you over to Emily and she will tell you all that she uh, about Jerome B. Murphy. Thank you for your attention. Good evening and welcome to everybody here this evening. The reason I am here is to speak about Jerome B. Murphy. He was the manager of the Cunard Line uh, back in the... Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, I think he's a forgotten hero. And he played a very important role at the time of the Lusitania tragedy. It's a shame there are commemorations. Of course, there are lots of heroes everywhere from that era. But I am here tonight because he has not been remembered since 2000, when the 100th anniversary was commemorated out at the old graveyard. So I'll just give you a little story uh, who was written by his great grannies, Levin O'Connell, and just to give you a little in, bit of information. Jerome worked for the Cunard Line in Cove, starting as a clerk in 1883, becoming an accountant and eventually an area manager for the Cunard White Star Line from 1914 to 1920. Every second weekend he had to travel to Fishguard on company business. He was in charge of the rescue and recovery operations after the sinking of the Lusitania in 1915 on the 7th of May. He had to interview all the bereaved relatives in an effort to, in an effort to identify the bodies. He grew more and more exhausted as more and more bodies were brought in. And finally, when he asked what to do, one more consignment, he cried in depression. What would we do with them? And he said, just take them down to the wash. His daughter, Dorothy, then aged only three, remembered vaguely, of course, watching him from the attic at the skylight of his home at number 10 of the park. As history is repeating, I now live at number 7 for the last 50 years. So a history is repeating itself. The ordeal went on for years as, it's, as single bodies continued to be washed up and it began to affect his mind. Meanwhile, Jerome had a growing drinking problem. Heavy drinking was an occupational hazard going off on the tender and an interview on the liner to interview the captains. He was constantly getting presents of cases of whiskey. He changed from drinking beer to spirits because he was putting on weight and this compounded his problem. He came, became more aware, more difficult at home and was insanely jealous of his beautiful Italian wife accusing her of going out with other men. When she forbade him and had a whiskey at home, he enriched it in his sister Kate's house and drank it there. In 1917-1918, he was called to Buckingham Palace 
he was awarded an MBE. This is 1970. He is a member of the British Empire by King George V, by services to humanity. He failed to return, and his son Angelo had to go to England to look for him. He found him in Manchester in a state of complete mental breakdown. He felt he hadn't done enough. I cannot decide for certain whether he actually received his medal at that in person. In 1985, it was the possession of Angela's wife, Peg, complete with an envelope in which he was apparently posted from England. However, Antoinette had believed that he did receive it. She told him he had to get a pair of white kid gloves where to shake the king's hand. Years later, when his wife, cousin, Peg Power, displayed her own kid love preserved in tissue paper, Annetta was convulsed with laughter at the thought that she had used Jerome's cleaning uh, tissue from the stove. He, I hope I'm not uh, boring you with a long time, but we'll come to <coughs> a bit more. He had at least one more course of treatment in Stuart Institute in Palmerston, Dublin, as he tried to, as he tried out and he went to work in an accounts office and was both useful and popular. At that time, Dorothy's marriage, 1939, he went to the church and gave Dorothy away. His wife, Annette, went to the reception but would not meet him. He died on the 16th of November, 1944, and is buried with his parents at the old church cemetery in Cove. His grandson, Dermot O'Connell, was, was there in, 19, well, in 1944. I remember him sitting in front of Kate's house in Cove, drinking from the saucer. His MBE medal went to his son, Angelo. That medal is now here in the Cove Heritage Queensland Museum for anybody to see. And in my eyes, he's a lost hero. Just to give, I won't go on too much about the rest of it. There's a lot more, and somebody else might like to, there'll be some notes there that you can follow. And um, just for example, um, only last week, my friend Jan went out to the graveyard because it was in a dreadful state. So, Jan and Paul, he has been um, forgotten about. Cleaned it up, and I'll just give you an idea. I'll show you later. There was a photograph of it last week before it was cleaned. And this is. This is this handsome Jerome B. Murphy and his beautiful Italian wife. They were a very happy couple, but unfortunately, the loose chain changed all of that. So, this is where. During the week, I got a gentleman from East Cork who has completely renovated the headstone. So if you'd like to have a look at to its originality, I think he's done an excellent job. Um, and this is some of the stories. You'll probably all get it. There is a, some notes around that you can follow. It's a very interesting story. I've only told, told you very little because it's most, and he's definitely a forgotten hero and it would be lovely if he was remembered because he was the gentleman who contacted everybody that time. He was the manager. He tried to he contact the English to get boats, but they refused. So he got the local boats to go out to rescue as many bodies as he could have. Unfortunately, several were lost, but lots were saved as well. But for the real story, I'd be here for a long time. But maybe if you can read the story, the leaflets, if you have them here for you, you'll get your names. And by the way, this is Jerome's great grandson. <laughs> sorry, grand nephew, sorry, my apologies.
I'm going to hand you over to my, the rest of my team who are just going to give you a little more of the story of the Lusitania. Uh, so. Karen is going to tell you a story. Yeah. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this lady, as you can see, still has her life boy on. And this photograph was taken of her as she was landed into the Commodore Hotel. Her name was Phoebe Amore, also named, known as Phoebe Sledge. She was travelling back from, Ile from Canada. She was travelling back to Manchester to see her 80-year-old mother and see her five sons off to war. When she decided on the day of the tragedy that she'd have a bath. So she took to the bath then realised that it was nearly time for the second sitting of her um, <coughs> of lunch when she heard the bell ring. So she decided, ran, threw on her nightdress, threw on her raincoat over that and ran for the dining room. <coughs> so she was just, she had just ordered when her soup arrived and she'd ordered a salad. And just as she did that, as she was ordering her salad, the boat was struck at 12 minutes past two. She made her way, everybody was ushered out of the dining room. She made her way to the stairs, but in, she, she has written a book called The Death of the Lusitania, available on Amazon, we tried the library. <laughs> and, um, in it, she describes how she seemed to get a super strength and made her way up the stairs and fought her way past men that were twice her size, even though she did fall three times on the stairs and she was 65 years of age. She got on deck, was ushered, was uh, quickly adorned with a life boy. She made her way to the, um, the, to the, to the boat, to the, the rescue boats. When she got there, she was told she'd better jump because they were going to topple. So she did that, and as she did, the whole boat toppled down on top of her into the water. But when she hit the water, she realised that she was floating on her back and realised that they had put her life jacket on back the front and that saved her life. She, stayed, she found another life, um, lifeboat. She hung on to the side of that for a few hours until she was picked up by, they eventually got her into the lifeboat after an hour or two and then she was picked up and brought to a ship. They were, she was brought in here to the Commodore where she went on her travels. Afterwards, she, she sued the German army for 16,500 euro, or sorry, dollars. She sued them for 16,500 dollars, 1,600 for her belongings, and the rest, even though at the time she claimed she was quite all right and never suffered any illness, she claimed that she had injured her <coughs> left, nearly paralyzed her left side, and injured her groin on the right side in the excavation. She was granted 6,700 and something in her in her, her, her claim. I'm now going to introduce, this is Jan, and Jan is going to tell you about Mary, Mary Holly, Holly Higginbottom. Oh, we Mary. all travelled in the same <coughs> cabin. We were, we were mates. Yeah. Uh, I'm Mary Higginbottom, and I travelled on the Lusitania and in the same room with <laughs> I can't know. <laughs> and um, I never made it. I was visiting my parents in England and then to coming from Massachusetts and I drowned. So that's what happened to me. <laughs> I did make also it. in the cabin <laughs> was Martha. Uh, I'm depicted with Martha Wyatt. Uh, she was 60 of New Bedford in Massachusetts. She was recently widowed and was travelling aboard the Lusitania to start a new life in England, and she survived the sinking. Martha was a native of England, and she moved to New Bradford with her husband, Aaron Wyatt, in 1911. After Aaron died, she decided to return to England, and she booked her passage aboard the Lusitania. She was travelling alone. I never heard any warnings about anything going on on the boat, she later recorded. We left New York with bands playing 
and a lot of singing. This is in her own words. I was on deck when the first explosion took place. Everyone below ran on deck. There was a great deal of rushing and confusion. A young man who was quite unknown to me put a life boy around me with the collar fit to the neck and with fastenings which came under my arms. While the ship was sinking, I found it impossible to get into any of the lifeboats. There seemed to be no help at all. I did not see any boats launched. There was a lot of shouting and a lot of screaming. I simply stood still, clinging to the rail, and I went down with the ship. I seemed to go to the bottom before I came back again to the surface. It was a dreadful sight in the water. Women were holding on to their babies. Children were floating around. Many people had their faces and their heads were bleeding. And I saw one old man die. The sea was covered with grime and black dust. I heard singing. I floated on my back and I folded my arms over my breast. I tried all I could to keep myself conscious and I believe I owe my life to this fact. It was not cold. When I was picked up by a boat four miles from land, I had been in the water for four and a half hours and I had floated over 20 miles. The boat took me to a ship whose name I do not know and my clothes were cut off me and I was wrapped in hot blankets. At Queenstown, I had to be carried to the hotel. Everyone was most kind to me and I was given sufficient clothes to take me home to Hurst. I managed to save my watch and you see it stopped at 20 minutes to two when I reached the water. I never saw that young man that gave me the life boy afterwards. I owe my life to him. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Stella T. Okay. Hi. Um, I'm representing a lady who was, or speaking for her, I suppose, a lady who was on the Lusitania. Alice Middleton was her name. She was English, but she was in New York working as um, a nanny for a family there, and she decided to go home to see her family and got on the Lusitania. Now, she booked as third class, but got bumped up to second class, which probably saved her life, because I think most of those in third class were actually locked in and couldn't get out to try and save themselves. And she was age 25 at the time, and she went, when, the, when the, uh, the, the torpedo struck, she went on deck, but she had no life jacket. But there was a gentleman there who ha was wearing his life jacket, and he shook it off and put it on her. And it is believed that he was um, Alfred Vanderbilt, the millionaire, and he actually he, he went down with the ship, he didn't survive, but he gave her. Now she got trapped in a porthole, is the story. I can't quite understand how that happened, but so she went down with the ship, but came up again, I presume because she had the life jacket on her. And when she came up, as the others have said, there was chaos all around her. And right beside her, there was actually a woman giving birth. We, don't, we know no more about that than, than um, did she or the child, or whatever survived. But she was, um, she actually gave birth in the water beside her as it happened. Uh, she was, the water was so cold, she lost consciousness. And when the ship got to Queen, well, when the, the rescue, people were rescuing the bodies, she was brought ashore with the other bodies and laid out in Queenstown for whoever was looking for her to come and uh, identify her. But one man who was looking, not for her, but for somebody else, saw her finger move and alerted the authorities. And she was then taken to the local hospital where she arrived and was uninjured. And she, uh, she was sent back home. To, she eventually went back home to England where she stayed for a few years. And she married a gentleman called George MacDougall. 
they had two children. She returned to America, to Detroit, where she lived quite happily and peacefully, from what one can gather, until the ripe old age of 74, when she died peacefully in her home after all that. Her, on, when she was on the ship, she was wearing a money belt to you know, protect her possessions as we all do. And it was still on her when she was rescued. And her granddaughter, uh, she's Jackie Wyler McDougall, and she lives in Michigan. But the, the, this money belt was kept and handed down in the family. And she came to Ireland fairly recently and donated the money belt to the museum in Kinsale. And it's there now if anybody wants to see it. This is where we've displayed uh, your grandmother's money belt. I've taken it out so that you can hand it again. Oh, thank you. And we've got, we've got the story here, we've got Alice's poem, and we've got some photographs which you sent us originally. I'm going to try to find a photograph of her so that you have that as well. That, that'd be lovely, because the only one we've got is this one, when, when she was an older age. And, there. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful! It's a wonderful artifact, and people do, because of recent uh, publicity, people do come to see it, and it's it's very I, I'm emotional. I'm so glad it has a home. Good. Because I'm the last one alive. Good. Well, then good that you're still alive. I, but I'm still alive. <laughs> Sorry, um, I want to introduce Kevin now, who is going to uh, speak to you about Captain Captain William Turner. Sorry. No, it's just the point. It's not Captain. Everyone thinks I'm just the Captain. Captain uh, William Thomas Turner was actually the commander, and he had no be He got no be over his years of service, and um, the. Biggest thing is, why am, I, why am I holding a hat? The reason I'm holding a hat is because his, his nickname was Bowler Bill. His name was William Little Bill. And every time he got a new command of a ship, he actually bought a new bowler hat. So it's, it's connected with him, the bowler. So that's why I bought that to talk about that. The thing that's really unique about it, he was torpedoed twice. First the Lusitania, and then the second one was Swiftster. Ivernia. Ivernia, two years later. And both times he actually managed to survive by swimming away from the ship. I mean, he was, must have been a fantastic swimmer. I mean, I can't swim, <laughs> but he, he could swim. Uh, if there's anything you want to ask me about it, if I have the information, I'll give it to you, all right? But that's the basic information. He was twice torpedoed, as I said. Um, sorry? Oh yeah, but uh, I mean, he, he got uh, he got medals and awards for bravery for saving other people in the water on other occasions. He was quite a famous person. Um, he died in 1933, but he was born in uh, 1846. Is that right? Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I don't like just reading it, I try to give it as it is. But if there's anything you want to know, ask me. Uh, he had two sons, Percy and Norm, Norton. Norman. 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 wrong here. Sorry. He was separated from his wife in 1903. Uh, very relevant information. <laughs> but he, he seemed to have been a great man. Even you know, and he became a commander, and the rest is history. Oh yes, uh, the, the thing I should mention: he died of uh, bowel cancer. He got it in 1919, and he survived until 1933 when he died. But he was 77 when he died. So he, he had a good life. And who was he addressed as commander or captain? 
Well, the commander was his title. That's the title we have for him whether he was dressed when he was actually on a ship as captain. I mean, he was... Commander is higher than captain, isn't it? Sorry. Well, one of the land, one of the you know? Oh, sorry. <laughs> but uh, he was the captain of those ones anyway. I would presume he would be addressed as captain when he was on board. Uh, on board. Thanks, Anything else, as I say? Ask us. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Jerome B. Murphy. Bernard is my second name. I had sons, Courtney uh, Senior and Courtney Junior. And uh, Courtney Junior was around when I was uh, trying to save all these people, 747. When the ship was torpedoed, it took 18 minutes to, st to fall on the starboard side and fall down and it is there to this very day still in its position unable to get to that position to see what followed because there was a second explosion and the second explosion was to say that they were carrying armaments or other um, bits and pieces of irrelevance uh, at the time and uh, and of course uh, I then uh, married in 1897 to my wife uh, to Annetta uh, from Italy and uh, that's uh, my little bit. I did my bit as much as I could for those. We laid them out on the paths in what they were dressed in and what they came in uh, along the path uh, here in Cove, Queenstown as it was then known. Thank you. I'd like to thank you all for coming here this evening. We're not professionals. We're trying to tell the story as best we can. Uh, it is very interesting. But just before I finish up, Jerome is the great friend's nephew. Oh, and he is a Jerome B. Murphy as well, to continue the name. And I'm very honored and I'm very, uh, he, Actually, my husband was his great his grand nephew. Yeah. So I'm the wife of the grand nephew mm -hmm. of the late Jim from B. Murphy. But for this evening, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, we'd like to give you an awful lot more, but it would take us an awful lot longer. We just have only one hour to tell the story. We have some leaflets there that will tell you more about the story. Uh, we are I'm very proud of my team. They're called the Cove Heritage Vintage Era. We're here for the last almost seven years. We're very privileged to have a venue in the Cove Heritage Centre, thanks to Mr. Jack Welsh for all his kindness and support that we've been given through those last seven years. Uh, I'd love to tell you more stories, but before I know, maybe Jerome, you would like to say one or two words, which is what we don't want. So <laughs> short. <laughs> All right. Anyway, for now, thank you most sincerely for taking the time to listen. It's our privilege that you are here. Thank you so thank you. much. I'd just like to thank Emily and uh, her daughter Anita for going to the trouble of finding out all these little bits and pieces and all the little anecdotes and uh, getting uh, pictures and, and various other bits to, to, together. But uh, uh, Emily, thank you. You can come in. Thanks for no thanks. But because we were all British, 
before 1921, then he was allowed to be, um, he was allowed to accept that. You can, of course, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 